There you go. Right. Hello, everyone. God, it's two o'clock. And welcome to episode one of Ask the Jama. Uh, my name is Anna Zario. I'm your host. Um, I can't believe I'm actually doing this one. It's so exciting. But um, I'm going to remove my glasses. I normally wear glasses, but I can't read notes with my glasses on. So I'm going to remove it. So anyways, yeah. Um, so welcome. <laughs> and with Ask the Drummer, you see, oftentimes we see um, interviews with singers and you know, they're mainly the focus of when people wanted to know about bands and stuff. And I always wonder, why don't we ask the drummer? Do you know? Because they're important too in the band. So hence the title of this podcast, Ask the Drummer. Today I'll be talking to um, two drummers, uh, a drummer and a percussionist of the band that I must say I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that um, I only found out quite recently when I saw them supporting um, the railway children, like this t-shirt, the railway children in um, Glasgow in 2017. So I am a newbie fan and I think for most, um, it, uh, there are sort of like newbie fans of this band. Um, you, I think you're gonna enjoy this because we'll find out more about uh, the band from the drummers. But if you've been a fan of this band since the 80s, uh, I don't know, maybe can we can we call them the oldies? Uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting as well and hope that you'll hear uh, things that you haven't heard before. Fingers crossed. Oh, so, okay, um, let me bring in my guests my two awesome drummer guests. Um, here's Chris Quinn and Paul Quinn of the Scottish band, The Orchids. Yay. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Anna. Hello, Chris. Hello, Hello. Paul. <laughs> so, how have you been? Are you Very good, thanks. Very well? Yeah, welcome to episode one of Ask the Drummer. And I just want to say thank you to both of you for, for agreeing to do this with me. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you, Anna. Thank you. It's about, time <laughs> you it's about time somebody asked the drummer. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah, because yeah, it's always just the focus is just the singer, sometimes the guitarist, but, you know, never the drummer. So I thought it's about time to sort of like, let's focus on the drummer. So nice. this... Uh, show is actually all about you, uh, Chris, and all about you, Paul. Um, last time I s <laughs> last time I saw you um, was Valentine's Day uh, last year at the Hundred Club in London. Yeah, that was an awesome, awesome gig. That was yeah, really good. We enjoyed so, that. Yeah, how have yeah. you been? And uh, so you know the <laughs> uh, well, that's I mean we've. We were in, that was when the pandemic was just yeah. starting to really kick off and all around the world. And we were in five airports within about three days in, on, on that time. Um, and we played Barcelona the day after we played London. Um, so that's the last live gig we've had. So yeah, we're really looking point. forward to playing in Preston next month. Because um, that'll be oh, yeah. since then. It's it's in three weeks' time. I'm really looking forward to that as well. Yeah, yeah Breast and yeah. Pop Festival. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, right. Before we actually get into the uh, interrogation part. <laughs> um, <laughs> you no. Um, let me just take this opportunity to say thank you to you, Paul. Um, really, thank you for you were so kind and. Um, caring and I don't know um, if you remember but um, at the start of the pandemic last year uh, I found out that a friend of mine was put into ICU and you know with COVID and he was really serious and stuff so as you do you post things on Facebook you know as if God is listening or something and then you sort of like ask for prayers and stuff 
So um, when I posted it, Paul, you commented and asked for his name and so you can offer a prayer for him and stuff. And I'll never forget that. I think you're so caring and you're so kind and everything and offering prayers and stuff. And um, it's, I'm really pleased to say that uh, my friend, he's, he's actually doing really good. He fully recovered from good. this virus. Excellent. He, yeah, he's back to normal. So thank you so much. Because that's what we need as human beings, isn't it? We, we need to look after each other and we need to be kind to each other and care for each other and stuff. So yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and also another thing that I want to, because I know that um, my King Bee colleague, Neil, hello, Neil, he's watching. So I just want to, um, cl yeah, <laughs> I want to clarify um, Paul Quinn. You're not Paul Quinn of the Soup Dragons. Which <laughs> later on, <laughs> which later on, um, become a member of Teenage Fan Club, I believe. Yeah, yeah. so no, it's not me. No, it's not me. that's not, not you. And no. you're not. There's, a, there's another Paul Quinn. Was a footballer, that, yeah. Scottish footballer was, as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, and uh, you're also not Paul Quinn, who released One Day with Vince Clark. You know? <laughs> no, not me either. No. <laughs> I mean, you're all Scottish, right? The three Paul Quinns, uh, like you and yeah. this other, you're all Scottish. And um, imagine if you saw, like, form a band, you know, calling yourself. <laughs> call it, oh, actually, Neil, my, my colleague said that actually four, four Paul Quinns. So just, you know, imagine that. Burgie, so, Burgie. Like, uh, Borgie, Borgie. Borgie, yeah, yeah, Borgie, Borgie, yeah, yeah. So, if all of you are so like, you know, becoming calling yourself the poor quince or something, <laughs> 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 anyways, <clears throat> right? So, now we carry on with the uh, with the actual interview and stuff. Now that that's clear, you're not those poor quince, but you're <laughs> poor quince, <laughs> you're poor quince, the percussionist of um, the orchids. We were actually yeah. sort of like before before we went live. We were actually talking about the difference between a drummer and and the percussionist. So, do you want to just sort of like say something about you know how different or how similar they are? The, the, the very <laughs> yeah, they they are different. You're just hitting different things, I suppose, but they are different because the rhythms on the percussion instruments are really important, whereas the drums are about the beat and the timing, I suppose. Um, yeah. And I've, I've found them um, since Paul's been playing percussion live, um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it really helps control things and, and makes it much easier for me as a drummer. So having a percussionist right. alongside the drums is, is something I find really, really, really useful live and it really yeah, adds yeah. to it. Right, good. Do you want to say something, Paul? Add something to that? Oh, can you switch roles? Can you be the percussionist, Chris, and Paul be the drummer? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we were talking about this because recording recently, we went for a week recording um, and we were both doing percussion. And I said to Paul, yeah. he's, he's better at percussion than me. So I said, well, I want you to do most of it on the record um, <laughs> because he is better at it. But he attends a, a percussion group. Uh, called the Glad Cafe Drummers in Glasgow. Um, so oh, well, he can maybe tell you a bit about that. But um, but we're both drummers. We, we, yeah, we both, yeah. um, I'm only, I guess I'm only a drummer because he had a drum kit. He was my older brother oh, right. and had a drum kit. Paul, went, Paul, is older. <laughs> oh, Paul is older than you, right? Sorry, sorry yeah, for that. Yeah. He's so older. So, right, what's it like in the Queen household? Growing up, you know, like with two boys playing on drums, like have you always been so like playing drums, the two of you, when you were kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we were never allowed to play in the house. Um, I, I guess I don't know, Paul, if you were, I don't know, I can't remember that. Oh. But um, I it was always in. We were always in a friend's house. Well, and it's John Scarley, the guitarist. Um, yeah. And, he lived in the same, we all lived in the same kind of scheme in Penalee. And um, 
we used to go to his house to play the drums rather than play them in my house. So, um, so we were, we were <laughs> to, that, to play the full kit. We forgot to mention our um, our grandfather. Uh, my mum, mum, my mum and dad were really, really, really patient people. They had four kids, um, four of us. But my grandfather, uh, my mum's father, was a drummer. Oh um, wow! Yeah, and I think possibly, well, it must have come from from him because he. Um, do you remember he, he used he used to come up? For, for his dinner, and he would use his, his his cutlery to drum on the table. Do you remember that drum yeah, on the and, plates? and on the plates? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and it, yeah, it did mum's head then. And and the sh- and sugar was a symbol. Sugar was a symbol. So you're from you're from musical family then, or was it just your granddad that's uh, yeah, a drummer? Just 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 him really. Yeah, yeah. The granddad. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got a question. I've got a question from Angela Riley. Um, I hope I think she's watching or something. Um, she said, "At what age did you start drumming, and who was your first teacher? Uh, are you? Did you go to drumming lessons, or are you self self taught?" Uh, I, 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 well, I mean, it'd be different ages we started, but um, I didn't really start playing the drums until. Um, until we decided to form the Orchids, so that would have been 17, 18, before I started playing the drums. Oh, um, right. You know, before that, um, yeah. we, did, we did music at school and did a bit of keyboard in school, but I was never musically trained or, or, or properly trained. Um, and okay. certainly drums was self-taught, um, absolutely. I, I don't think I've had a drum lesson in my life. <laughs> it, it probably shows. <laughs> but Paul, but Paul, about... Paul's, Paul's story would be different from mine. Though. I, I don't know if you started younger, Paul. Uh, um, I think I would only be about seven or eight years old, and my grandfather um, took me along to one of his gigs, and I sat at a very early age next to his drum kit, and I was absolutely blown away by this drum kit at that age, and I always wanted one after right. that, but. I, uh, what was the question, your first lesson, or when did you start? I started. When did you start? Yeah, uh, and, like, what was I, your first teacher or something, if you, if you had drumming lessons and stuff? I started, what, what was, who's, who's asked the question, was it Angela? Angela Riley, yeah. Um, Hi, Angela. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> what I, if you're listening, what I did was I took um, clothes pegs wooden clothes pegs and I used them as drumsticks in my in my my bedroom and I right. had um a book over there for the hi hat, a book there for the snare drum, a book there for the mounted tom and my symbol was invisible. So I just hit an invisible <laughs> symbol. And what I used to do the first record I just played Denis Denis by Blondie. Oh, over yeah, and over that. again and I just repeated that song and I learned it off by heart um, before I even went near a drum kit so right. um, oh, I don't know I, I would say try and just enjoy it before before going for a lesson you know just um, just drum on the table <laughs> <laughs> drum anything just, just like your grandma's all like using your table <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> and, and, uh, because practice, obviously, you, I think you've got practice pads now, haven't you, Chris? But I, yeah. I don't. I think it's, it's a difficult thing to do to find somewhere to practice. So, um, you know, improvise in the house, find something in the house that you can that you can that use. You can, uh, you, can like, buy, you can buy. Yeah, you can buy rubber yeah. practice pads as well, which aren't quite the same. But um, that was how I started at a very early, early age. Yeah. So you didn't go to any sort of, like professional drummers for drumming lessons and stuff. No, it's it's but funny because yeah, it's funny because I did in the nineties, like early nineties. I thought I wanted to be a drummer, so I went to like this professional drummer and did so like a couple of weeks with them. But because I was just so amazed with drummers, I didn't learn anything. <laughs> I, <was> just, <laughs> like, I just said to him, 
No, you play it. You play it. Come on, you're so amazing. I can just watch you play it all day long. And then that's it. And my brother said, my brother's actually a drummer. I hope he's watching. Um, he said, you're just wasting your money paying him, but you're not learning anything. <laughs> so, but yeah, again, from Angela, Angela Riley, um, she wants to know what was the name of the first band that you joined? Or oh, what was the yeah. My first band. Now, Ronnie from the Orchids might um, disagree with us. I don't know. I, I, when we were in sixth year, which is the final year in school in Scotland, yeah. we um, we kind of had a, a, a punk band where we had oh. uh, we dressed up in plastic uh, bin sheets and we, we did a short gig. Uh, and I can't oh, remember yeah. the, the name of the band we did. We, we, we um, I think we were, I don't think the teachers liked what we played. But um, yeah. shortly after that, shortly after that, I played in a band with Ronnie, um, and I think we were called Stolen Property. Is that the one? Because, <laughs> do you know, I'm sort of like looking for photos to use um, for the Astro Summer page, inviting people. To, to watch you and stuff. I saw photos of you um, posted by, I think he was the singer of your band. Uh, like old photos with you, so like on the drums and stuff. Is that. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. That, on, was, on that was Horse, I think. Um, I think oh, was that Horse? Yeah, yeah, because you. Yeah, because yeah, you played yeah. in Horse. Like, th this is Horse McDonald, right? Horse McDonald, yeah, we played, Ronnie played bass and I played drums with Horse McDonald, yeah. Oh, she's fantastic. I love her voice. I saw oh, yeah, her, yeah, like... yeah, I saw her a few years ago and she's just so amazing. It's in a place called, I don't know if you um, heard of it, Thornton Hoff Village Club, which is somewhere, I, th I think it's still considered Liverpool or something. But it's, yeah, I saw her there and she was just really really good i've got a photo with her as well as you know, you know i like having photos with this musician so i need to have a photo with you paul when i see you in um when i see you in preston so can i yeah, do that? Nice. yeah. <laughs> right what about you chris uh what was the name of your first band well it's uh, um it's really just the orchids it was um, just like the orchids James, yeah. um, but we were called gentle tuesday was our was our first name before the orchids I think we went through a few names after after song names, some bands that we liked. Um, we were called yeah. The Love Parade um, after an undertone song, and we were called The Boy Wonders after an Aztec Camera song, and then we were called Gentle Tuesday after a Primal Scream song. So, wow, um, <laughs> so many names. That, that was our go-to for a band name, I think. Um, oh. But it was just it was just me, James, and John in a bedroom, um, learning as we went along. Um, when we were just teenagers, so, so you, all grew up together. you all grew up together. The uh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We, we, we've all, me, John, and James have known each other since we were about probably 10, 11 years old, and went through oh, wow. school together. And that's when we decided to to form a band um, late on wow. at, at school, I guess. But um, and obviously, Paul and Ronnie were always we always knew Paul and Ronnie because they were in in the band. Which is negative with with horse as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and so yeah, yeah, we've known each other most of our lives. And yeah. This is in um, Penny Lee, right? That's where yeah. you're yes. from. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, apart from Penny Lee, you know, like the home of the orchids. <laughs> I'm quite interested. <laughs> I'm quite interested. What is Penny Lee famous for? And is it how? Oh, like, like how far it's, it's in Glasgow, right? Yeah, it's, it's just a, it's just a small scheme, a small housing scheme, I guess, in the southwest of Glasgow. Um, I think it was built for. There's a big industrial estate called Hillington Industrial Estate, and I think basically Penalty was built for the workers in the estate when there was lots right. of factories there, and it was a Rolls Royce factory, and they probably during the war made. They, they probably made weapons for the war and stuff like that. So I think oh, it probably right. sprung up from that um, when 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 workers were working in those factories. So oh. so we we grew we grew up there in the I guess the 
70s, 80s. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know what else it's, fa- what else it's famous for. Um, <laughs> how, how easy it is to get from like Glasgow Central, like from the city centre? Is it quite easy or is it further out? Um, it's fairly easy. You just get the That's train easy. probably takes, the, 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 there's a train station um, near right next to Penalty, so probably yeah. it takes about 15, 20 minutes from the city centre on the train. Right, because the reason why I'm asking, because um, I don't know if you've seen, but I like going to all these places with connections to the like, musicians and stuff. Like when I go to Glasgow, there's that Killamont Street sign. Yeah, yeah, you know, near yeah, Buchanan, yeah. near near Buchanan Street Station. And I like having a photograph, so like standing, just so like underneath. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I was so like thinking, oh, is there a place in Penelope where it says the home of the orchids or something? Uh, like, you know? <laughs> good idea. Well, that is an yeah. excellent idea. <laughs> well, I can well, have a photograph, and I can so like yes. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. the, the street the street's called Clavens Road in Penalty and um, John and James both lived in that street. I didn't, but um, that was our home was Clavens Road because that's where we started. Um, there's an interesting story about that because the original drummer in, the, in Primal Scream that played on the first two singles also stayed in that street. So okay. a wee bit of a musical street. And, and Primal Scream used to rehearse in his house um, oh. So Bobby Gillespie used to walk through Penalee to Cravens Road to go and rehearse. You know, so, oh my God! Are you, yeah. are you also like friends with Bobby Gillespie? In this? No, no. Because no, you know no. what? <laughs> you know what this is. Um, as the drummer, it's all about what Bobby Gillespie said. He said a band is only as good as its drummer. Right. Do you agree? So, yes. Well, <laughs> He, he, the, the guy I'm talking about um, that lived in Clavens Road, he got sacked after two singles, so that doesn't... <laughs> that doesn't um, oh dear. And, 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 and did, did Primal Scream not use a drum machine most of the time anyway after a while? So, no. Um. <laughs> so, but it's, well, it's a, but... so they're only as good as their drum machine, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but do you think that this, you know, that's true? What Bobby Gillespie said. I mean, actually, somebody said it's not Bobby Gillespie who said it, but I think it's uh, Joe Strummer or something. But right. I don't know. But it's a good, it's 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 a good quote, I think. You know, a band is only as good as its drummer, which yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Drummers are really no. important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, the name uh, of the band, the Orchids. Um, were you when you decided that this is what we're gonna call our band? Uh, were you aware that there were actually two other bands called the Orchids? I mean, the one that I've got here, I've got this. I don't know if you can see it. These are girls. <laughs> yeah, and is that the fifties girls? Is it fifties or sixties girl band? Yeah. Not I think that's that's the other one, which is a sixties girl group. Right. But these are more like the go go style. They're also <laughs> British, but they're like glam. And I remember, I because I got this record before I even found out about the orchids, like your band. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I saw like went to the railway children gig and they're saying that the support. Is going to be the orchids. It was so like thinking, oh, I wonder if there's these girls. Oh my god! That must have been a big <laughs> I know, but um, so how did that? How did you decide to so like <clears throat> have the name, uh, the orchids? But can't, did you... can't remember Anna because and we, we have talked about this. I can't remember who came up with that name or or why we came up with that name. We did yeah. try to change it in the last minute as well because we weren't really happy with it. But I think somebody said our first flexi sleeve had been printed up already, so it was too <laughs> late to change it. Um, so we just stuck with it, and well, thirty years later, that's that's it's still there. I don't think we really knew there was other bands called the Orchid. So you didn't know about them. I don't know. We did find out about that eventually. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, this was 
this was before the internet and things, so um, we oh, yeah. we never heard of those bands called the Orchids, but eventually yeah. over time we did we did discover yeah there was other bands, but um, I guess the the one we were worried about was getting mixed up with the Blue Orchids who were out at that same oh, time as well. You know, they're from, so. they're from Manchester, aren't they? The yeah. Blue Orchids. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, I think was it the same year that you were at Shine On that the Blue Orchids also played at Shine On that time, or was it? Sort of like no, it was different. different. No, it was a different, oh, a different year. Yeah, so, a different yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just seen a comment here from uh, our friend Jessel, Jessel Baltazar. He, he lives in Canada, and he said that he loved the he loves the flyers and posters on your wall, Chris. He's, he's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Jessel. Um, right. Okay. Um, this I Google because, like I said, I mean, I feel embarrassed. I've only found out about the orchids four years ago when I saw you at Audio in Glasgow. But I've Googled. And um, so the orchids formed in 1985. Yeah. Is that right? And, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait, um, so. The original members like James Moody and Matthew Drummond, uh -huh. are you still in touch with them or what are they doing now? Do you know? On, on, on occasion, yeah, Matthew still lives in Glasgow, um, so bump into him sometimes, but I haven't, haven't seen him for a wee while. Um, maybe at gigs and things like that because we still share a lot of musical taste. I think one of the times we saw him was at Michael Head played yeah. in Glasgow and Matthew was there so James and I bumped into him there yeah, um, yeah. and uh, and James Moody is um, now in Sweden lives in Sweden that's why he left the Orchids and, and Ronnie then joined in bass yeah, so he yeah. still lives there but we're only in touch with him through social media but we did play in Sweden a number of years ago now and, and, and we caught up with James Moody there as well he came along to the gigs um, and we went and saw him at his house and stuff so so yeah so you're we'll still friends yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, I, if, can I just say that if James is uh, watching or listening just now I would like to thank him because it was in Gothenburg you played wasn't it and um, that was when I last saw him in Gothenburg after the gig um, the following day and I was feeling a bit rough and we went James kindly took me to a shop in Gothenburg and he bought me a banana so I would just like to thank him for that um, Sorry, what, a banana? A, yeah a ba <laughs> 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 I was like, banana. <laughs> Is there is it like a, a special banana in Sweden or in Gothenburg? <laughs> it was, Gothenburg it was a it was a special banana to me in Gothenburg because it was the morning after the gig and I don't know what time we got to bed, but um, I needed a banana. And James, oh, right. kind, I didn't need a banana, I just needed food. And, he, and James, you kindly yeah. uh, took me to a shop and bought oh. me a banana. So oh, thanks for that's that. brilliant. <laughs> that's very I, cool. haven't, I haven't forgotten that. I think oh, James, came up, James came up on stage and sang. Um, sang along to one of the songs as well in, in Gothenburg. Oh, wow. Oh, that's brilliant. Right, um, your first single, um, I've Got a Habit, which was yeah. released um, on Sarah label. Mm -hmm. um, before I ask a question, Derek Patience, you know him because he's a member of the Orchids um, group. Yeah. Hey? Uh, he just wanted Hi, to Derek. say... Yeah, <laughs> he just wanted to say to you, Chris, that he loves the mental drumming at the start <laughs> of "I've Got a Habit." It he is said mental. It's brilliant. <laughs> it is <laughs> mental. You can tell that I'm not trained on that. I tell you, and um, I was going to just say that when you mentioned the single, I was like, "Oh, the drums and that." Oh, yeah. You know, um, we couldn't afford a great studio. We didn't have a lot of time. Um, so it ended up like it ended up, but I'm glad Derek likes it. And so as long as somebody yeah. likes it, um, I can't drum as fast as that anymore. Now, <laughs> you know, I was like, was a young guy then, so I probably can't yeah. drum as fast <laughs> as that anymore. Well, well, this here's the question now. So that first single, uh, which is 
Sarah 2, number 2. Mm-hmm. Um, I've looked it up on Discogs and it's actually selling for £290, which is like, so the question is, so did you keep copies of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I've only got one. I've only got one. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, Vincent Tesoriero, I think that's how he pronounced his name, Vincent Tesoriero, he lives in Australia. Um, he's saying, uh, he wanted to uh, ask you, how do you feel that your records are worth so much money now? And if you didn't keep copies of that record, do you feel upset that, <laughs> that you didn't keep that? <laughs> Like all your records from like Sarah label. Um, I think we've probably all got one copy each. Um, yeah. And even if we did, we we wouldn't sell them. I, I don't understand that. To be honest, um, there was only there was only a thousand of them in nineteen eighty eight, and yeah, okay, they would have sold out. But if somebody wants to pay that for a record, I think it's, I think it's crazy, and I think. <laughs> that's of, like we've re-released stuff on CD and downloads and stuff like that, and um, yeah, yeah. try and get away from that. But people want the original. I can understand that people want the original thing with the sleeve and the insert, and um, but I think it's mad that people would want to pay that. Um, I know. No. I know. Um, I, I have, I've got say a one pristine Christine, and that goes for even more, but. I, I thought about selling that because I don't really play it that often. But then I thought <laughs> I could not, I could not take that amount of money from somebody. I would have to just give it away or something. Or I just yeah, don't think like, oh, records being so much money. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, my colleague uh, King B. Um. He just commented that he can't believe how expensive Sarah, all these Sarah singles are now. Because yes. um, he said that he remembers selling them for about. One pound fifty each at the time, and yeah. you know, and but now, like Sarah won, I think the CEO, the CEO, urchin, urchin something, um, that's selling for even more than two hundred and ninety pounds. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy, and it's not what saying it's not what Matt and Claire would have wanted. I don't think. Um, I guess, um, but it's up to individuals if they want it. If they want to pay it, yeah. then it's up to them. But, but I think it's a bit crazy, and it's not what. Sarah Records was about getting something out immediate and, and getting it cheaply to people. So yeah. it wasn't about being a collector's item necessarily or certainly not being very expensive to buy. It was all it was all about being immediate, immediate pop and just getting it out there cheaply. Um yeah. <laughs> to, to people. You know, as you say, a, a, a pound, a pound fifty for three songs. Yeah. On yeah. EP, you know. So So I think you- it's crazy. That the old records are selling for that is yeah. Well, you kept your fanzines, right? You've got yeah. loads of them, yeah. Because I remember you saw like posting. Are you selling them or something, or have you sold no, them? No, I just no, I didn't, still... I didn't sell any. I just sent them away to people who wanted them. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. If anybody, you know, anyone listening, if you want those fanzines, you can always contact Chris. <laughs> No, they're, they're, they're all gone. I got, I got rid of them. All. Oh, they're they, all they, gone. They were just sent away. Yeah, they were just sent away. Even even some went to America actually, and I think I've still got I still got one to send to somebody. I think in Canada, which it's just taken me a long time to do. So, so no, I would rather right. these things were given to somebody who really would treasure them, and so I I sent them to people that I know would would treasure them and keep them and yeah, and yeah. wouldn't sell them on for 50 quid. Again, I think that's crazy. A fanzine that was 10 pence <laughs> for 50 pounds, that's just crazy. But it's up to individuals <laughs> again. <laughs> right, so um, right, going back to the history of um, the Orchids, um, there's a lineup change in 1993. That's when Ronnie Borland joined. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is also like um, on Wikipedia stuff. Then you went quiet in 1994, uh, but then resurfaced in 1995 to play at the Sarah Records farewell party. What yeah. was that like? And so were all the bands on the Sarah label were there, or 
No, not not all of them. No, the the, the field mice and the sea urchins had split up by then. So um, there was quite a few. Heavenly Boy Racer, um, Blue Boy, ourselves. That's just from memory. So um, yeah, that was. Uh, I can't remember that gig to be honest. I can't. Oh my God. I can't really recall much about it. Um, <laughs> it was it must be good then. You just you know when you. That's what they we, say, that if you can't remember it, they must yeah. be gone. <laughs> we, we, only, we only played about six songs, so, um, yeah, it was, I guess, a stra- it was strange to, to go down yeah. after having done nothing. Oh, okay. So, um, um, I've just seen that my friend from New York, Rowan, just saw, like, send us a comment and stuff but he's got a question for uh, the both of you um he wants to know how did the decision come about shifting from indie guitar pop sound of the first album to edgier pop electronic stuff on the next two albums so i think it's like lyceum is a more indie guitar pop and unholy sound and striving for the lazy yeah. perfection which i've got here and i've, I've been listening to this today <laughs> this is actually this is like really really good it's one of my favorite albums ever oh, so good. how so how did that um how did the decision come about to, for that shift it, uh, it wasn't really a conscious decision it was just an evolution i think of of music and and going at the studio and um you know, working with Ian Carmichael uh, in, right. in the studio and just developing ideas like that. It wasn't a conscious decision, um, but I guess some some of the band got into some dance kind of elements of music as well, and that would have influenced it too. So yeah. it, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just a, a kind of evolution of the music, I guess, um, over time. Uh, right. So Ian um, Carmichael, he's also... An official member of the Orchids, even that, though he does, yeah. he doesn't that's play. Yeah, yeah, but he does. He does. He does play keyboards and does, yeah. does lots of adds lots of things to the records. Yeah, absolutely. But he doesn't play with you live, though, does he? Or no, no, no. He's no? never, no, he's never played live. No. Yeah, because I don't think I've, I've seen him with you when I've been to your gigs. So. It, it doesn't no. come to, no. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So when you took a like when you took a break in nineteen ninety five and got back together in two thousand and four, is that actually I've asked you for this before. I was gonna say, is that when you joined the band as a percussionist, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been striving to join the band um, as a percussionist for a number of years now. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I think it might have have started where about did it start this? Was it Indie Tracks or was it Gothenburg or uh, maybe um in Glasgow I used to go along as Chris's older brother and Ronnie as a friend base um to the gigs and I would have a tambourine and you know, sitting at the side of the stage and then I started to jump up on the stage and just play the tambourine and, and and then um, it went on from there. And when when would that be? Um, uh, well, you, you've been jumping on my tambourine for years. And years, <laughs> years so I, I don't know when that first was. Um, I remember you in Berlin jumping on my tambourine. Um, <laughs> King Tut's one time. Uh, I thought. <laughs> Jumping on stage, I was all like thinking, I've just seen Graham, Graham Norton. Doesn't he sort of like jump on stage as well and join you? <laughs> Hello, Graham, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs> um, right. So um, when you got back together, um, again, Rowan from New York, um, he wanted to know how did the reunion come about? Um, yeah. The- we kept talking about it every time oh. we went to the pub together. We would say, yeah. "We need to get back. We need to get back to you know rehearsal or whatever." And and then the next day we'd forget about it, and then we'd meet up in the pub again, and then say, "Yeah, remember we were talking about getting back to rehearsals." 
Ah, uh, yeah, we need to do that. And that went on for years and years. Um, I, I actually got made redundant um, in 2003, and, I, and it kind of gave me a wee bit of a, um, a, a bit of free time, I suppose. Um, and it made me kind of push uh, for us to get back together. Um, and we eventually did. Um, it took a long time, but um, the orchids always take a long time over everything. <laughs> and, and, and so we did. We went into a studio, a studio in Busby called Riverside to rehearse um, and write new songs. Um, another thing that happened at that time was James Nice from LTM Records had made contact about re-releasing some of our original records. So I think that oh, gave us a wee bit of momentum as well. That we knew that was going to be re-released, and maybe maybe we, you know, get a wee bit of attention from those re-releases as well. So around about that time, um, those yeah. two things were happening. Um, so, so yeah, and and and, and ever since we've been we've been keeping doing it, you know. Um, so well, it's Vincent, been amazing. Yeah, Vincent in Australia actually said that um, the band is more popular now than in the early nineties. Do you agree? <laughs> I think you're getting more fans. I mean, like myself, you know, I wasn't really aware of the orchids in the yeah. 90s or even in the 80s. But, uh, um, you know. oh, that, I, don't, I don't know. It depends how you measure it, I suppose. I mean, see the 100 Club, Anna, it, that was, that's just incredible that, that it was a great crowd. There was people from eight or nine countries at that crowd and you know that would never have happened in the past, but but we don't sell as many records now as we did back then. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it depends, because... it depends how you measure with the popularity, I suppose. But are we talking about so like physical physical formats or or maybe yeah. because yeah. into downloads now though? Yeah, mm -hmm. but we. We, we don't sell many downloads or CDs, I guess, or, or certainly not as much as what we did back in the, the 90s. But right. that would have been a lot to do with Sarah Records um, and, and, and what they did to push our music at that time. And, and um, you know, John Peel and things like that. Um, yeah. So would, would have been helping with all that. Um, and live, we were playing to bigger and bigger audiences. Um, oh, no. Uh, during the nineties as well, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. but but now I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Just <laughs> maybe maybe it feels like we're more popular because of the internet, because of the worldwide interest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm originally from the Philippines and I got this from a very reliable source. I mean, um I don't know if he's watching, but his name is Jess Manuel. And I call him the indie master because when it comes to indie pop, you know, he, he really knows this stuff. But he said that in the Philippines, um, how you got the um, fans, the Filipino fans, um, apparently a kind of Eden was played uh, heavily and it was popular amongst the, uh, there's um, a radio station in the Philippines called NU107. And um, apparently they had this Groove Nation session and the listeners of that Groove Nation session, they, you know, they became so like um, they heard uh, a kind of Eden and they really loved it. And I mean, I left, I left the Philippines in 1989, so I didn't get to hear any of, the <laughs> any of these songs, but I was um, searching YouTube for it. I even found um, I think a band from Thailand covering um, a kind of Eden, and yeah. it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. How do you, how do you feel about <laughs> that? Like all these people from like you know from all, all over the world, like Philippines, Thailand, or I'm sure other it's, places. Wow. Well. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. It's uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we love it. Obviously, um, I think it was it was that the Smoke and Bone cover of that song, and I think. I think, I think that yeah, I think that's the one that I saw. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think when you hear it stripped back like that, you, you just realise how wonderful a song it is. So that maybe comes down to James because you know he'll he'll written a song, James Hackett, um, yeah. and it's just a wonderful song. And to me, it should have been a it should have been a huge hit. But see the fact that people from the Philippines listen to that and 
love it and are from all over yeah. the world. I think it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> to, it's unbelievable, and um, I think it's brilliant. Well, my friend um, Jason, he's Jason Priest Frente. Um, he lives in London now, but he's also originally from the Philippines. He said that "What Will We Do Next" is an absolute fantastic song, um, and he wants to thank you. You know, he wants to thank the whole kids for music. So. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I all also found out that in the Philippines they released uh, an album called "Good to Be a Stranger." Um, which is like, um, that's a Philippines release. But when I looked on Discogs, there's a Thailand release as well, and a Spanish release, but not a UK release. So um, have you, So it's called Good To Be A Stranger, that album. Uh, yeah, that was the first one after we got back together um, on yeah. uh, the Siesta, the uh, Madrid, the base of Madrid, Siesta Records yeah. in yeah. Madrid. So it's probably through them. Um, you know, and and that probably sold more in other places than it did in the UK. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but were don't they know, were they released there as well? Because uh, when you look on Discogs, I mean, all the so like um, country of release, just Spain, Thailand. Right. I, I, I think you could, I think you could get it in the UK. Maybe it wasn't widely it wasn't widely promoted or distributed, but I'm sure you could get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I, I'm sure I went into HMV and it was it was sitting there one time. I'm sure. Oh. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Um. Again. Um. Another question from Derek and also um from Rowan in New York. Who were your um, biggest influences? Paul, I've been talking too much. You 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 start that one. <laughs> <laughs> you, did you, you your, your biggest influence. <laughs> Influences on what? Influences on uh, drum, drum, oh, I suppose it's like yeah. drummers, like yeah, yeah, drumming influences, or you know. Right. Okay. Um, I um, the the story I was telling earlier on about um, Jenny, Jenny, you know that song, Jenny, Jenny. Yeah. Blondie. Um, yeah. I absolutely have always loved um, Clem Burke uh, from Blondie, and. I've never seen him live for some reason. I've never seen him live, but he is his his um, posture and the four piece kit and the just he's just a, he's a showman. But he's got a solid, yeah. solid, solid, solid beat. I think one time um, I played with Horse McDonald years ago in Glasgow, and I think I put water on one of my drums so that when i hit the drum the water went every which obviously some people objected to because <laughs> there was a lot of electricity about but i think i might have got that idea from from clem buck but um, oh. i just love i love clem buck and i also love john bonham led zeppelin and um, mm -hmm. um because he just plays a simple like clem buck a simple straightforward beat and he uses his hi hat and, and his bass drums always there as well. And, and I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I would. You wouldn't copy them, but you would probably, probably they would influence. Um, they would influence me in a way that I would want to be in the background as a drummer and not to be. You, some drummers, I think, try too hard, um, but I think a drummer should be. When I say in the background, Clem Buck is up. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. I saw him once. Yeah, yeah. You saw yeah, him? I saw Where him. It it's like really mental, but um, he didn't play with Blondie. He played with another sort of like American group. And I, think, I can't remember the name of the group. <laughs> I'm so bad, I can't remember. <laughs> but it's um, sort of like Bill, this Clem Burke and the, uh, this band. And uh, I, I was able to get a photo with him as well. I was, I was so pleased. But, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I know. He's, he's just amazing. He's very nice. A very nice guy. So. Also, our, in our house, Chris, I don't know if you remember, but um, in Penny Lee, Penny Lee, you said Penny Lee. Penny Lee sounds much better than Penny Lee. 
Oh, anyway. sorry, how the... <laughs> I like Penny I like Penny Lee. Oh, but, so um, how do you say it? Sorry, is it Pen Lee? Uh, no, it's Pen Lee. He's, he's, it's Pen Lee, it's an I. I'm trying to say it in the glass. <laughs> Glasgow accent. Anyway, <laughs> in our house, <laughs> when we were growing up in Pen Lee, I remember, Chris, do you remember the, my mum and my dad, uh, when they had um, four kids, my mum was 21 when she had me. My dad was uh, 21 as well. And then, you know, with the four kids, so the music that they were playing, it was mainly the Beatles, I remember. It was mainly oh, um, yeah. the Beatles, and as well as, like, uh, what else was it? Uh, Simon Garfunkel and uh, stuff like yeah, that. Just, yeah, just was always, always music on the background in the house. And I remember, I can still remember... Um, listening to the, I don't know if it's the way the, 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 the early Beatles albums were recorded, but you always heard the, the tambourine and the hi-hat in, in songs like, or even Norwegian Wood, you know, when you hear the, the woods and stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah. but I don't know if you're, if you're allowed to say that Ringo Starr influenced you because I believe that uh, Paul McCartney said Ringo Starr wasn't even the best drummer of the Beatles, never mind the best drummer in the world, is that right? <laughs> but I think he's great. I think he's great. Um, so, yeah. Um, and Yeah, so Chris, what was your mine, thing? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess as drummers go, mine was Pete DeFretis from Echo and the Bunny Men. Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. see, see me went see them live and, and he set his cat up at the front of the stage just to the you know, just to the right hand side of Ian McCulloch. So he was he was he wasn't in the background, he was up the front and yeah. Um, I just loved his drum and see on uh, just on all the albums, but on Porcupine and the way he used the toms on Porcupine so, uh, the, the Echo and the Bunny Man album. But then when he went on to Ocean Rain and um the stuff he was doing with brushes and rods and things like that on Ocean yeah, Rain, yeah, just yeah. it just uh, it was absolutely brilliant. I just loved that. Um so I guess he was a big influence on me in terms of in terms of drummers, but yeah, um, yeah. I mean, my favorite other. I, mean, I, I just like it's like Paul said. I just like simple, effective drumming. Um, and ha you see how Blaine, yeah, you know, um, if if he did, did he do the drumming on Sound of, Sound of Silence? See the drums on Sound of Silence. That's just to me the best drum track. Um, oh. The timing <laughs> is the timing of it, and the and the sound of it is just absolutely perfect. Um, it's a perfect drum track to me, um, and I think that was Hal Blaine that did that. I don't know, he's done thousands and thousands of sessions. <laughs> but, um, so I, th I guess some of the you know sixty stuff, like Paul said, um, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the Beatles and stuff like that as well. Just, just, just kind of simplicity, but just makes it That's, to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned that um, Pete Freitas was at the front or next to uh, Ian McCulloch when yeah. they fight. Um, how do you feel about so uh, like drummers always behind, you know? I mean, I wish it would be like the you'll be put on a pedestal or something that everybody can see you. <laughs> because you know with me, like when I go to gigs, I always sort of like position myself where I can find where I can see the drummer and actually yeah. get a good photograph of the drummer. But yeah. I can never <laughs> I can never sort of like take a good photo because you're so far behind. It's almost like <laughs> Why can't they just so like put them eye up so you know we can see them? And Anna, Anna, I played um, I played drums with Horse McDonald. Uh, I yeah. remember one uh, very early on in Horse's uh, career, and we played at Glasgow University, the Queen Margaret Union, and I hadn't been playing that long, and we went up onto the stage to set the, the gear up, and they put the drum kit on a stage, the drum kit on a stage on the stage. So I was elevated <laughs> on the, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, I just, I don't know, because there must have been a couple hundred people there and, and then somebody put lights on underneath and a light into the bass drum and yeah. I had lights, I had lights coming and I was like, I don't know if I, I want <laughs> to be, you know, up here and you know, one mistake, you know, uh, <laughs> Um, so I think some drummers probably quite like to be in being the, high up. No, no, no. no. 
to be in the background, just you know, the <laughs> just like getting keeping the beat kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind. I don't mind being in background, but um, yeah, I've played the drum risers before as well, and a few, you know, a few of the bigger venues we've played. But the, the trouble with drum risers is that John Scally, our guitarist, just keeps <laughs> jumping on them. And there, was, there, there was one time he was jumping so hard on the drum riser that my drums were coming up. And, you know, so they were coming up, and my timing wasn't right. So. Um, no, it's always good fun, um, but I don't mind being at the back. I don't want to be like Pete the Freitas and set up right at the front, but I did love the fact that the drummer was at the front at Echo the Bunny then yeah. and played live, yeah. <laughs> um, Derek Patience for it to know, what is your favourite Orchid song to play, or songs, to play the drum song? Mm. Watch it, have Watch what you're saying here. Sorry, Dan. You say one percussion. Uh, be before you want <laughs> so and, and also there's a follow-up question from richard where where i don't know yeah i think that's how you pronounce it and yeah. you know richard as well don't you yeah um, yes yeah yeah he also just saw like a follow-up question to uh derek's um is there an orchid tr track that you find the most difficult to put a drum pattern to so mm. your most favorite orchid song to play the drums on and the most difficult so like to put a drum pattern that, that's really hard but I, I like playing something for the longing um because it's a bit uh, you, you know it's a bit kind of loud and brash and um yeah there's lots of symbols in it and stuff like that but yeah but um i also like just this you know we play caveman all the time and i just like playing that sometimes because you really get to hit the drums really hard and play them really fast so yeah um so i like the thrashy ones i guess is <laughs> but there's there's lots of them like bemused confused and bedraggled and um but um from a percussion we were just talking about like, love child during the week um from the striving album and the, 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 when we've got percussion on that, I like playing that as well. Um, so, but definitely the thrashy one. So Derek, um, probably, uh, it's probably something for the longy or caveman or my favourite yeah. ones. Play yeah. drums on, you know, it's just because you get to express yourself a wee bit. Um, <laughs> but um, but sorry, Richard's question was, what was the hardest one? To yeah, play? the most difficult to put a drum pack into. Hmm. That's his question, yeah. Or if there ever, um, if there was ever a track you find difficult to play live. Yeah, there's. I, you, you always get that when you've maybe got your song set out in the set list, and you and you look down and you go, oh, "I can't wait to get that one out of the way because that's oh. I'm making a mistake on," you know. Um, <laughs> but I'm, oh. That's really hard, which <laughs> Paul, I don't know if you've got why I think about this, Paul, I don't know if you've got favourites that you like to play on. Um but Yeah, well, um I what when did um when did a place called home when was that was recorded in um uh, in Glasgow? What year was that? Eighty eighty nine, eighty eight, eighty nine. Eighty eight, eighty nine. Yeah. I um remember when the orchids were in the studio there and, and I was uh, asked to do a bit of uh, conga on a place called home and mm. I absolutely, absolutely love that song and it's just so, it's I just love it and I think Claire, my wife, played uh, a bit of harmonica on that as well and we still, when we hear that song, it just, it's just one of my favourite songs but more recently, I think Love Child we did, we did Love Child. And oh, I London love Love Child. I love that song so much. And I think, That's actually, yeah, uh, when you played it at audio in Glasgow, I just really love that song. Yeah, and, and I love it. So, yeah, I was so and, grateful. Cause, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. The, the interesting thing about Love Child is that we've never, um, I would love to say, say for Chris and I to set two drum kits up and both play together. And we've never done that because um, if you ask any drummer, yeah. it's an absolute treat to play with another drummer you know, together. But that's as near as we get to it, I think, on Love Child because I'm, I'm doing the, the conga or the, the, the 
the ball goes in your. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I enjoy I enjoy that one as well. So, so see, go back to Richard's question about the hard. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking, give me some peppermint freedom in the first single. That's a different kind of timing for us usually. So I always find that hard, but we didn't play it live very long. Um, very yeah. often, um, so so that that was one with a different kind of time signature from what I'm used to. Um, but uh, but but playing live, I can't I can't think of any that I find more oh. difficult. It, it's just maybe that so again I like the thrashy ones, faster ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think the stamina comes into it then as well. You know, if you're <laughs> too many fast ones, you think, oh, oh, I've not got the energy for this. <laughs> now there's another follow-up question from Derek Patience he said um, uh, he wants to know which song again or songs by other artists that you um, you wish you could play drums on oh a good question <laughs> so, sorry Anna what other um, artists have... which song or songs by other artists do you wish you could play drums on uh, I'm thinking so like in the air tonight by Phil Collins. You know, oh, 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 oh. No, I just don't know. No. no way. No way. <laughs> so, any any song that you can think of that you that you wish? That I wish you it. Like? I wish it. Oh, in terms of what I wish I could play the drums as well as that, or um, yeah. you know, I, I again, it's like. I go back to Sounds of Silence again, you know, I just wish I could play. I could play <laughs> smoothly and as perfectly as that. Um, or, or you think that people like Steve White, you know, from Paul Weller's band and Ocean, did he play for Ocean Colour Scene as well? Steve White, you know, uh, wish to play drums as well as what he can. You know, he's just unbelievable um, what, what he can do with drums. Um, but to me, that's like, that's like looking if you if you are playing football at a certain yeah. level and, and wishing you were as good as Messi or Ronaldo, you know. So so there's there's, <laughs> there's no point in wishing that. But um, yeah, so I wish I could play drums like as, as well as Steve White. And um, the song I wish I could play drums on is probably Sounds of Silence again. Yeah, or, oh, or, or maybe yeah, yeah. Ticket Ticket to Ride by the Beatles. I love the drums in that as well. Oh, okay, sure. That. Uh, what about you, Paul? Drums, um, geez, oh, uh, so many. I mean, so many, any, yeah. Blondie, any Blondie song, any oh. um, <laughs> any REM song with Michael Stipe. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Any, um, even a guilty pleasure here. Uh, how about, uh, what's his name again, the Queen guy? Uh, Roger uh, Taylor, uh, Queen, oh, at Live Aid, something like that. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it was you all know, like, what, was it Roger Taylor Queen or Roger Taylor Duran Duran? <laughs> uh, Queen. Queen. <laughs> yeah, that was right. Queen. That was, that was Mum's fault, by the way, Chris. She, she asked, Mum sent me out to buy the Six Things version of Bohemian Rhapsody and Woolworths. Um, and um, so I blame my mum for, for my Queen. Uh, my uh, Queen. Gu guilty pleasure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, well, well, let's talk about um, drumming disasters. Because um, um, oh, my friend Andy, Andy Chua from Canada, he calls it sort of like asking any drumming shtick, he calls it. I think it's mishap or something. And again, um, specifically from Richard, um, he wants to know have you ever had a spectacular mess up on stage when drumming? <laughs> oh, my so, Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, I'm sure we had to. I can't remember specifically. I know I, I do remember B, we were supporting BMX Bandits once at Bedford, um, and we were playing "Bemused, Confused, and Bedraggled," which is one of the thrashy fast songs I was talking about. And I was hitting the drums so hard that my stick broke in half. Um, thankfully, we were near the end of the song, so yeah. I managed just to thrash it out. And you know, I didn't have. I'm not like one of these professional drummers. I saw, saw the icicle works at, at Shine On, and and like you, Anna, 
when I'm watching live bands, I tend to watch the drummer because it's more, yeah. it's, it's the most interesting thing to watch. So, um, it's very so exciting. It, to watch drummer, and I saw his stick break in half and fly off, and without even missing a beat, he picked the stick up off the wee bag on his tom and just kept going with the new stick. And God, I couldn't do that. But so support BMX Bandits. There was that being used, confusing the draggled. Um, there's been other times where we've done a, we've done a daft Keith got drunk and done a cat, you know, a Keith Moon where you're <laughs> kicking the drums over and stuff like that as well. Um, just for the hell of it before the end of a song as well. Um, and and there's been a couple of times where we've had to just restart a song because I've made the mistake. Um, yeah. I, once at the Glad Cafe, we'd um, there's a song, the coolest thing. Um, where there's a stop in it and there's one of the stops the timing of when we come back in changes slightly but i forgot that and, and came in too early um and and ronnie wouldn't let me continue he he waved his hands and stopped the song and said no 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 we need to go back to that but rather than just letting us carry on with a mistake that nobody noticed <laughs> So there's, there's a few in there, but I think if you're a drummer, it's I don't know, I don't know. I I always come off and say, "Oh, I made a mistake there, and I made a mistake there." And most people say, "I didn't hear it, or I didn't notice it." Yeah. So, so, yeah. so it doesn't it doesn't worry me when I mess up too much. <laughs> how many how many drumsticks do you actually take with you when you saw like do live shows? And stuff? Uh, just, a, just a bag of probably i don't yeah. know there's probably about seven eight sets of sticks and brushes and rods and beaters and just different things so it's just a bag of of sticks yeah the thing the thing that i love about drummers um yeah you know, when they start the song and then they count like one two <laughs> that's always so i think that's really good <laughs> <laughs> But it's always the drummer who wants to start the song, you know. It's like, um, <laughs> and what about you, Paul? Any drumming disaster? No, after plenty of time to think there where Chris was talking there, and I cannot remember, um, which is quite amazing. I think I can't, you know, I think if a drummer makes a mistake, um, it's usually quite a high profile thing, and I, even, even if I was. Think of all the gigs I've been to. I can't remember. I, you know, the only worst thing I can remember was uh, Stuart Copeland from the Police. He burst his snare drum, you know, and I, you know, that's the only thing I can remember in all these years. So no, I cannot. I think you just you just prepare, don't you? And you get. I can't think of anything. No. I I, I just remember that I burst a snare drum, snare drum once in a, a very early gig, nineteen eighty seven. And, and we were actually supporting somebody and it was his drum so he was raging <laughs> so it was the drummer in the main band's drum that i bust so yeah he wasn't very happy um angela and angela riley and richard were um like to ask do you play any other instruments apart from like drums and percussion instruments and no i've got a, i've got a guitar and a keyboard in the house but Nah, I don't play them. I can't. I would profess no. being able to play them. So, I have um, an inflatable guitar, <laughs> um, which I, I, I would I would thoroughly recommend it because um, you yeah, would just Norton, what? Dan Norton should get a, an air guitar. Oh, it's guitar. It's fantastic. You just blow up the, the guitar. You put on your favourite. Uh, track and you can yeah. even take it to, to, to gigs as well I've taken it to <laughs> gigs as well and, um, so yeah I play the inflatable guitar <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> right. well let's talk about your fans because I know that Chris you are a bit of um, I don't know if you mind me saying it but um, a fanboy you know you, you are a fan yourself, and yeah, like me, so. I'm a fan girl. Um, what's the most bizarre thing that um, a fan has ever done to you or to the band? I mean, I should really ask 
Graham, no. <laughs> that's the most. <laughs> so anyone, you know, like with Tom Jones, we're having all these so uh, like fans throwing knickers at him or something. Did you, did you get any of those kind of no, stuff? No, no. no, no. <laughs> Come on, Anna, you've seen us. Uh, um. Well, say when you were young, you know, like in the early years of the orchids. What's what's sort of like the most bizarre thing that um, that anyone or a fan has sort of like done? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, can't tell. Well, can't tell on that one. No, can't tell on that one. No, can't tell on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, can't mention that one. What 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 springs to mind is there some somebody. Somebody cut a wrist at one of our gigs once. Oh no, no. no so um that that was bizarre. Um <laughs> you know it, it's a bit odd to have that when you're playing and somebody's you know done that in the in the crowd and yeah. um, when when you can see it, but <laughs> um I, 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 I don't know, I think I, I, I think the robot how do you feel? probably get, <laughs> gets the boat. <laughs> How do you feel towards your fans? I mean, like, I mean, let's just say general things. Like, do you mind if, say, someone like me, you know, like asking you for a photograph and and sign oh, not, records? And not, stuff? not at all. We we find that a bit weird, to be honest. But um, but uh, yeah, no, no, no. We, we we love that that people um, like our music so much that they'll come up yeah. and ask us to sign things. I mean. I remember the first time it happened, we were playing in York and somebody asked us to sign their single and we were like, no, nah, we're not signing your single because, you know, that's that's not right that, that you want our signature. <laughs> um, we just couldn't understand it because we were just like we guys from Penalee and we're like, why do you want us to sign your single? Just, well, it'll ruin your single if we if we scroll on it. Oh, no! So, yeah. um, so I guess we'll... We've grown up a bit since then and realised that yeah, it's brilliant that people yeah, come up and talk to you and want to yeah, ask you yeah. questions and yeah, um, so so no, we, we we love that now that people come and talk to us and, oh, that's and good. You know, so you don't, for folks. Yeah, yeah, you don't find them so like a nuisance because you know I know that after a gig you're all tired and you just want to sort like rest and stuff, but um, you know and then you see all these fans asking you for. Stuff. For things so you don't you don't sort of like find them like no we just want to no we just, I, no absolutely like, well, no you, <laughs> you love that you love that that people like it enough to come and talk to you you know um and and often you'll say that you'll maybe be in touch with people who've been at a gig and then they'll message you on on, on facebook and you'll say you, should, you know you say you should have come and spoken to us you know um if they were there but they maybe haven't yeah. but no we would we, we no we we love all that, yeah. It's uh, oh, that's good. It's, it's, that's it's good. great to it's, it's great so to do at that. Least, at least I feel confident that I'm not so sort of like you know pestering you when I ask for a photo. <laughs> <laughs> sure not, no. <laughs> right. Um, this is a question from from Graham. Graham, not, I saw him earlier. I saw the comment there. And he said, "Can he have a copy of How Does That Feel?" For his birthday, I think his birthday is um, the Sunday that we're in the um, Preston Pop Festival. So I looked it up. I think it's is it the um, uh, penetration EP? Is that is that what he's asking for? I, I don't know. How yeah. does that? Is, feel? Is, is he asking for us to play it live on his birthday, or is he asking know, for he a just, copy of the he, single? Yeah, he just said, "Have can he have a copy?" <laughs> right, so he wants a single. Well, have to see if we've got one then, Graham. <laughs> are you looking forward to the Preston Pop? Festival? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah. and say it's the first time since February last year we've been able to play live and we've had a couple yeah. of rehearsals up to now and, 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 and that's been good as well because we couldn't rehearse either um during this time. So to get back to playing is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really looking forward. I'm really looking forward to it as well. And I'm so yeah. lucky because it's sold out. Um, I think in 
a day that it was um yeah. posted on facebook and stuff so there's quite a lot of people asking for tickets for that but right. i went to preston i went to preston last friday and i was so like i went to this record shop called action records and hoping to find a poster of that preston pop festival because <laughs> <laughs> you know i like posters <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but he said the owner of this, um, the owner of Action Records, said to me that because it's sold out quickly, there's no need so like print posters, you know, right, for right. it. So, I'm, yeah, sure Rico, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we could get you one. <laughs> yeah. um, to, to, add, to add to your growing collection, Anna. I know. Um, <laughs> I know. Um, right. I know it's one, one really. One of the things about festing is, is is actually kind of being on the same bill as the Bluebells and and also being on the same bill as so many other amazing yeah. bands. You know, Ghost um, Lobster is the one that yeah. after. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're playing the side I'm really as well. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, like I went to see the Bluebells in 1986. Um, absolutely loved them, and if anybody said you'd be supporting them and. Uh, Many years later, and they've been like, "Nah." <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so, are you gonna help me then? So, like having you know, asking them for photographs because they oh, must know you. They must no, know you're, you. You're you're the expert at that, Anna. You're <laughs> you for help. <laughs> oh, I know it's um. I, I just so like love talking to you. A bit. Um, I've got another question from Rowan in New York, and this is really funny because he wants to know. What's your favorite beer? I think, you know, asking that, if the orchids happens to be in New York, at least he'll know what to get you <laughs> when he gets to meet you. So, or oh, what's your favorite tipple? <laughs> Paul, what's your favorite? Perone, Perone. Um, Perone. Italian, <laughs> uh, and Italian what about food? you, Chris? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I drink I drink an old man's beer. It's called Tenant Special, so it's made of Glasgow. <laughs> so it comes in a yellow can, and and that, that's my favourite beer. Um, have you got any advice to any um, aspiring drummers out there? Uh, keep keep at it because um, if uh, if I, I've got tapes, I've I've got cassette tapes of the orchids rehearsing early when I can't play the drums. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, to any young, any young person that playing any musical instrument, I would say, just keep at it and um, yeah, and persevere. Yeah. Because I would play them that, and then say, well, I got to play on seven albums after being as crap as that on it. So, so keep going. Don't give up. Oh, oh I've got. I've actually got this message from Graham now. He's got the single, uh, but he wants you to play them. He wa oh, sorry, he wants you to play How Does That Feel for his birthday. So, yeah, okay. he wants you to play it for him. <laughs> sorry about that, Graham. Right, I thought you wanted a copy of that single. <laughs> right, so any ad advice, Paul, for aspiring drummers? Clutz. What's that? What's that? Is it like stress Uncle. balls? Uncle. Oh, juggle, right, right. Oh, juggle, yeah, yeah. Oh, juggle, juggle. yeah. Juggle. Um, what is it? Is it about working your left hand? I think. Um, work your left. So get so take up juggling. If you're if I, if you're an aspiring drummer, and juggle, and it works your left hand. Oh, so there you go. That's my advice. And that's I, very interesting. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> That is so good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I know it's like I said to you before that it will only be about an hour, but we're so like, you know, 20 minutes into it. I've only got this one last question. And um, this is from Phil Ludkin. You've seen it, Chris, before, and, um, but Paul hasn't. Uh, Phil wants to know what drummer joke have you heard the well, most? <laughs> and what's your response to it? <laughs> oh my God. See, I was actually going to ask the same question as well, because I remember when, when Mike Joyce had a, a radio show on um, Excess Manchester, um, he said um, he likes all these sort of, like drama jokes. And there was one time um, 
he he said on air that someone asked who's the drummer and then the answer is he's the one who hang out, hangs out with the band <laughs> <laughs> so he's not really, you know, which is, I thought, oh, that's a bit, you know, the drummer is important in the band. So, so what's your favorite? <laughs> what's your, well, not really favorite, but uh, the one that you've heard the most, Paul? I love jokes. I just love jokes. So my response <laughs> to any joke is to laugh, and I laugh at the drummer's jokes as well. But <laughs> what is my favorite? Um, my favourite, was that the question? Uh, the one that you've heard the most, and what's your reaction one I've, to it? The one I've heard the most is maybe, uh, God, so many to choose from. Um, <laughs> how, so many how, drummer do know, <laughs> how do you know when a drummer is at the door? How? <laughs> Just go. <laughs> because the, the knocking speeds up. <laughs> so, um, oh, it's a good one. <laughs> well, Chris, if you throw, if you throw a hi hat and a snare drum off a cliff, which one reaches the ground first? Which one? Who cares? <laughs> well, what's your reply to that? I know that I've, I've read your reply to Phil Redkin on the Facebook page, but do you want to sort of like say no, that again? No, I don't. I, I don't make like that joke. It's, um, <laughs> I can't even remember the joke, to be honest. Um, it's about not being a musician, but I don't mind that because I'm not a musician. So if if I was, um, if I could play other instruments and stuff like that, then I might mind it, but I don't mind that one at all. You know? <laughs> so that's the one right. I hear the most. Yeah, um, right, before I let you go, can I just so, like say hello to everyone who's tuned in? Like, we've got Pav, um, Pav Fox, he's a percussionist himself. I met him in, he's in Leeds, and I met him there one time when I went to see um, uh, Ben Watt. Um, he did an album launch in um, a record shop in Leeds, and that's where I met him. And of course, my um, colleague at King B, Neil Barker, he's watching. Uh, my husband and my daughter, they're both watching, which is really good, you know. You Thank, you. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hope it's not been a waste of a Sunday afternoon. No, <laughs> no, I'm more concerned, but I hope you're so like enjoying it as well, you know. Like, um, I'm worried that maybe, oh, why am I giving her, you know, the time and stuff? So, I'm really glad. I hope you're. You are having a great time and stuff. No, um, it's been great to chat. It's been good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Levi from uh, the Philippines. Um, she's a good friend of mine as well. She's saying hello from the Philippines. Um, Graham, hello. Graham Mosler, I think he's from Stockport, like you know, like where I am. So and hello from Manila, from my friend, my high school friend Malu. Uh, she's watching as well, and Jessel in Canada. I'm right. sure you know him because Jessel is like he's he's in, you know always saw like both some Sarah records I think and then it's like right. all indie indie stuff yeah he's the one who loves your flyers and posters on uh, on your wall Chris. thank you Jessel uh, thank you yeah and of course we've got Graham and um, oh also Jessel said that do you know when uh, you said that James Moody bought you a banana. <clears throat> in uh, Gothenburg. That's how you know you have a real friend when he gives you a banana when you are there. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and Rowan in New York, he is also watching. So thank you very much. Um, and Jason in the UK is my friend. Um, another friend of us from um, uh, in London, he came with us to see you at um, 100 Club. Um, in London, that Valentine's Day, 
Do you know, um, I was going to say that um, I nearly missed my bus back to Manchester that evening because I was having <laughs> I was having a really nice chat with Mrs. Hackett because Mrs. Hackett oh, yeah. was there, we were chatting and she's so lovely. Yeah, I lost lovely. track of the time. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I was running towards the bus station. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, it was so good. Um, Gilbert, my, my other friend from the Philippines, you know, he's watching. He said that um, he wished you sold all your Sarah records to them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Because I think I remember when I started collecting records, um, some of my friends saw like saying, you know, if you happen to see a Sarah, a Sarah record, you just buy it from. And I was so like, yeah, sure. I mean, here, you know, those seven inches are you know, like 50p, one pound and everything. And I didn't realize at the time, I mean, you know, people or record collectors who have Sarah uh, records, they keep them. They don't sell them so anyone is actually selling them they sell them for a huge amount of money so yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, a revelation to me yeah <laughs> um and yeah well that's that's really good thank you so much and um my husband said that juggling that's a really interesting advice paul so <laughs> that is so good so any any final words from you to to our uh, viewers? No, I, I, thank you very much, <laughs> Anna, for inviting us on the first one. Um, I hope you thought, I hope you feel it's gone, <laughs> it's gone well enough. <laughs> oh. um, so thank you very much for that, uh, for for inviting us on for it. Um, it's been it's been oh, really good to, to talk, and thanks to everybody who who listened in or watched um, the podcast. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much because. Like I said, you know, I haven't done anything like this before. I'm not really into sort of like online shows and stuff. But I'm really glad that both of you said yes yeah to it. And having the two of you for episode one, I just think it's so amazing. It's so good. <laughs> so, um, Paul, your um, last word to our uh, viewers. No, I really, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it. It's a great idea, and um, great idea for the podcast. And um, and I'll I'll look forward to subsequent podcasts. Um, and I love your background. Ask the drummer for oh, that background. I absolutely yeah. love it. No, well, it's good in it because uh, I hope he's watching. It's my friend Ryan, Ryan Samig. Thank you so much for doing this background. He's he's a drummer because, like I yeah. said, you know, he's a drummer in the Philippines. I mean, I love drummers. I think they're so awesome. You know, they don't just play drums; they do. Uh, they play backgrounds like this as well. <laughs> right. So, thank you so much, and um, I really look forward to seeing you in. I think this uh, part, I don't know. But, but I'm really looking forward to seeing you in practice. Yeah, likewise, Anna. Thank you. See you there. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Oh, my God. <laughs> so that's it. First episode done. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Thank you all so much. Um, for watching uh, Ask the Drummer and um, I hope you'll continue watching it. I've got a great guest for next week. Uh, keep an eye out for the announcement on the um, Ask the Drummer page. Um, so I, th I guess I guess that's it and um, I just want to say I'm, I'm really I'm really grateful to all of you and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, um enjoy the rest of your um weekend the rest of your sunday thank you very much uh love music love life be happy always and stay safe and don't forget love 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 drummers thank you bye bye <laughs>